about shape of the region of where an electron is located at, okay? But hey, I wanna make one note here to you guys, okay? Because exclamation point, different orbitals have different shapes. So different orbitals have different math equations which get graphed out to be different shapes. Different orbitals have different shapes. And remember, you're dealing with two types of orbitals in OCHEM, right? S orbitals and P orbitals. So let's see what the shapes of these orbitals look like. Okay, so for example, let's look at an S orbital's shape. S orbital, okay? And hey, does anyone know what an S orbital looks like? An S orbital looks like a sphere, right? So hey, if you were to graph this out on some 3D graph paper, so a 3D graph paper has a Y axis, an X axis, and since it's in 3D, then you're gonna have a Z axis too, okay? Okay, so if you were to graph out an S orbital on some 3D graph paper like this, what this would look like is a sphere. Okay, and this is an atomic orbital. This is the region where electrons are found if they were in an S orbital. So guess what, you guys? Here's your nucleus. Here's your nucleus right here with your protons and neutrons. This 3D sphere revolving around it is where electrons are at, right? So check this out. Remember when we drew out the diagram of an atom? Let me draw it up here real quick for you. Okay, so remember our diagram of an atom, right? You guys, we got our nucleus with the subshells around that and the exact location of an electron in these green rectangular boxes, the orbitals, right? So hey, we had an orbital right here. What this sphere is telling you is that, hey, electrons can be located anywhere in this subshell. So hey, this orbital can be here. It can be here. It can be here. It can be here. It can be here. Okay, it can be anywhere within this sphere. And I drew it one place arbitrarily right here to begin with, right? Because hey, it might be there. But hey, if you graph the probability of where an electron in an S orbital is going to be, it's going to give you a sphere, a sphere like this, okay? And this is just like if you have a dog. Any of you guys have a dog? Okay, well, I don't know if you guys do this, but a lot of people with their dogs, when their dog wants to go outside, but they don't have time to look after them, what they do is they put a stake right in the middle of the yard, like a wooden stake or something, right? And then they tie a rope to the dog's neck. So they'll tie a rope from the stake to the dog's neck. So, hey, here's my dog. And I'm not like a great artist or anything, you guys, so you'll have to forgive my artwork. So there's my dog and they tie a rope around his neck, right? And they're like, okay, dog, you can go wherever you want now. But guess what? This dog is contained by a sphere. He can't go anywhere outside this sphere because he's trapped within it by that stake. He's prevented from moving outside the sphere because he's tied to the stake. And guess what's preventing these electrons from going outside their sphere? You guys, there's negatively charged electrons that are trapped in this sphere. And guess what's trapping them inside this sphere? the protons inside the nucleus, right? Because a hey, protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, opposites attract. This is just like a dog with a rope tied to its neck, okay? There's a plus charge on the nucleus and a negative charge on the electrons, and this is what's keeping the electrons inside this sphere. And that's why we can guess that these electrons are located somewhere within this sphere. Okay, so that was an example of one type of orbital, an S orbital. The other type of orbital you guys are going to be dealing with is a P orbital. P orbital. Okay. And does anyone know what a P orbital looks like? P orbitals come in lobe shapes, lobe shapes. And what these would look like is, they would look like lobes, okay? So, hey, if you drew out these on some 3D graph paper, so there's the X, Y, and the Z to give this guy some three-dimensionality. All right, so, hey, what a P orbital would look like is lobes. So let me draw that in. Okay, so, hey, what these would look like is lobes like this. 
This is actually just one p orbital right here, you guys. A lot of people confuse this and they think, hey, there's two lobes right there. One, two. But no, 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 you guys. A p orbital consists of two halves. This is one half, this is the other half, okay? So together, they are one p orbital, all right? And there are three p orbitals, one going up and down, one going side to side, and one going back to front, okay, on the z-axis. So, hey, this would look like this. There's the one going side to side, and there's the one going front to back, okay? So if you graph the math equation for a p orbital, it looks like this. It doesn't look like a sphere this time, they look like lobes, okay? So depending on which lobe an electron is in, whether it's in this lobe or this lobe or this lobe going front to back, then an electron can be anywhere within those lobes. So hey, if it's in this one going up to down or top to bottom, an electron can be here, 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 okay, if it's in this p orbital, okay? And hey, if you want to see how this looks like with respect to our original diagram of an atom, then check this out, you guys. Okay, so if we look at our original diagram, where did we see p orbitals? In the second subshell of energy levels, right? So, hey, here was energy level one, right, you guys? And it didn't have a second subshell, so here's where energy level two began. And this second subshell is where we drew three p orbitals, right? You guys, we drew one up here, one down here, and one over here, right, you guys? And the reason why we drew them in this arrangement is because this is how they sort of look like in 3D. So check this out, you guys. Let me draw in some lobes here to show you exactly how this drawing matches up with this drawing, okay? So let me draw a lobe right there, there, and there. And check this out, you guys. Doesn't this, doesn't this right here look exactly like the graphed out lobes we drew up here? Okay, so what I'm saying is, this top thing is like this top thing, right? This one going to the right is like this one going to the right. And then this one down here is like this one down here, okay? And of course, I've only drawn half of each of these p orbitals in this drawing, but it's because if I drew out the entire orbital, it would have just been one big mess on this diagram, okay? So this way you can see exactly how the graphed probability equation was represented in our original diagram of the atom. Just realize that there is a second half to each of these orbitals, right you guys? So hey, just to recap, we've been going over what an atomic orbital is. We said that an atomic orbital was our best guess of the location of an electron in an atom with respect to its nucleus, right? We said that we made this guess based on probability equations that we graphed out. And different types of orbitals have different equations which yielded different shaped regions. S orbitals are spherical regions, P orbitals are lobe shaped regions, right? And now for the moment you've all been waiting for, what is a molecular orbital, okay? Okay, so let me erase this and we'll talk about molecular orbitals. Okay, so we've seen what an atomic orbital is. Let's see what a molecular orbital is now. And let me preface this by saying that a hydrogen by itself like this, with its valence electron, is considered a hydrogen atom. These two hydrogens stuck together like this by sharing their two valence electrons is considered a hydrogen molecule. So one atom by itself is just an atom, two of the same atoms put together is a molecule. Like, have you guys ever seen things like H2? or like N2 or O2 oxygen. These are all molecules. This is a molecule of hydrogen. This is a molecule of nitrogen. This is a molecule of oxygen, okay? So, hey, sort of knowing what a molecule is, let's write down what a molecular orbital is now, okay? And all a molecular orbital is, is the overlap of atomic orbitals to lower the energy of the system. Let's write that down. A molecular orbital, this equals the overlap of atomic orbitals to lower the energy of the system.
Okay, so a molecular orbital is the overlap of atomic orbitals to lower the energy of the system. And this is really how bonds form. So let's see an example of this. Let's go ahead and use H2, for example. And hey, I'm gonna show this to you two ways, okay? I'm gonna show you how bonds form using a Lewis structure diagram, and then I'm gonna show you how bonds form using a molecular orbital diagram. But hey, let's start off with the Lewis diagram first. Lewis diagram. Okay, so we're gonna be combining two atoms of hydrogen to make a molecule of hydrogen, okay? So, hey, let me draw two atoms of hydrogen up here, each with one valence electron, right, you guys? These are going to combine to make a molecule of hydrogen, which looks sort of like this. With these valence electrons now being shared between the two hydrogens, okay? So, what's gonna happen is, is that, hey, this hydrogen had one electron, this hydrogen had one electron. They hooked up to form this hydrogen molecule, okay? And how did this happen? What is the glue that sticks atoms together? Sharing electrons, right? Okay, so this is why another way of drawing this compound is like this. Okay, to represent that, hey, there's two electrons, one, two, being shared between these two hydrogens in this hydrogen molecule, okay? So one more time, you guys, this hydrogen had one electron, this hydrogen had one electron, they hooked up to form a bond, and this lowers the overall energy of the system. And by system, I mean, hey, everything has a certain amount of energy, right? This atom, have, uh, this atom of hydrogen has a certain amount of energy, this atom of hydrogen has a certain amount of energy. By combining these two atoms into one molecule, this lowers the overall energy of these two atoms. So hey, if you added up the amount of energy from two individual atoms and compared that to the amount of energy of two combined atoms, then you'd find that the energy of the two combined atoms would be less than the two individual atoms, okay? So, hey, for example, and I'm totally making these numbers up, but just say that each of these atoms of hydrogen has 10 joules of energy, okay? 10 joules, 10 joules. So if you add that up, that would make 20 joules for the two, right? 20 joules for the two individual hydrogens. Now, if you combine these two atoms of hydrogen into one molecule, let's say the energy of this molecule is 16 joules. So let's just say this is 16 joules. Okay, so you just lowered the overall energy of this entire system by four joules. Do you guys see that? It went from 20 joules as individual atoms to 16 joules as combined atoms into this molecule.